Hey, everybody, Eric Grenier here, and welcome to the 30th episode of the Red Podcast. Voters in the riding of Athabasca in Saskatchewan will be going to the polls on Tuesday. So what better time to check in on the state of politics in Saskatchewan? And to do that, I'm joined today by Adam Hunter, the provincial affairs reporter for the CBC in Regina. Adam, thanks for doing this. Anytime, Eric. Thanks for having me. So it's been uh, just about a year and a half since the last provincial election in Saskatchewan, and uh, it wasn't exactly a competitive one. So, you know, Scott Moe probably feeling pretty comfortable, but, you know, how is it going? How have that, uh, those first few months of Scott Moe's first electoral mandate, how has that been going for him? I mean, the pandemic kind of clouds everything. It's hard to to say, you know, during that election, we covered that election here in Saskatchewan. Um, the pandemic hadn't really hit the province in the same way it hit other other provinces during the first wave. Uh, so obviously the campaign was a little bit different. Scott Moe did his victory speech in front of, you know, no crowd. Uh, it, so quite different. What's a scene we've seen, I, I know, play out throughout the pandemic with different elections. Uh, as far as how it's gone since then, it's been like the pandemic waves for the province. You know, during the summertime, this past summer, things were quiet. And then the Delta wave hit Saskatchewan particularly hard, as it did in Alberta. Uh, Saskatchewan, one of the uh, hardest hit provinces, having to send patients to Ontario for care. Uh, The hospitals were overwhelmed. The ICUs were overwhelmed. And at that point, uh, Scott Moe putting in uh, some health measures that are set to expire fairly soon here, uh, as he just announced that this week. Uh, So in mid-September, he was uh, forced to uh, put in mask mandates, something he said he didn't want to do. Uh, was reluctant to do also uh, proof of vaccination or negative test policies and mandates for for government workers. Those are soon to expire with proof of vaccine expiring on uh, February 14th in Saskatchewan. And then the mask mandate won't won't be renewed as of March 1st. Uh, So of course, Alberta has since announced uh, their plans to do the same thing. Uh, But in in Saskatchewan, I think the, the, the premier's, um, you know, experience since the last election has been dominated as it has throughout the country by the pandemic, by the government's response to the pandemic. There's been uh, very little chance for them to put forward uh, some of their policy proposals. Uh, you know, we've seen you know, a couple of, you know, uh, plans to get back to a balanced budget, uh, but that has even been pushed, I think, into the, into the f- future because of the impacts and the financial impacts of the pandemic. You know, you mentioned the restrictions that are going to be lifted pretty soon. In some ways, it does seem, at least from here in Ottawa, that Alberta and Saskatchewan have been often marching together in some way, you know, sometimes a little bit reluctant to put restrictions in, sometimes lifting them a little bit earlier than other places, and now lifting them a lot earlier than a lot of places. How has the recent announcement gone over? Because um, you know, I was just looking at the hospitalization rates in Saskatchewan. They do seem to be coming down a little bit, but they're still really high. Yeah, hospitalizations are really high. The other change the government has made, Eric, is they're going to not daily updating COVID statistics, but weekly, uh, so weekly on Thursdays. And uh, we're hearing that there's going to be a record number, uh, you know, and that should be sustained, I think, throughout the next few days. As we know, people are uh, tend to stay in hospital, you know, with COVID-19 related illness for, for a little bit of time anyway. Uh, so they're saying that it may be peaking here, but that it may be, it's going to be a high peak anyway. Uh, how it's gone over, it's a bit of a mixed bag. So we've reached out to a lot of different groups, a lot of different people. Um, people in the hospitality sector have, have said, you know, they're uh, looking forward to uh, potentially getting a, a more business because people may have stayed, stayed away. Uh, it's going to depend, obviously, on the, the spread of the virus and what people think uh, their risk is. Uh, while we heard from the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, which represents the, the uh, First Nations across the province and a bunch of tribal councils who came together with a joint release the day of the announcement saying that they were not in favor of uh, the, the measures being lifted, that they said it wasn't safe to do so, then they want those continued. Uh, masking at schools is going to be an issue in certain areas. Uh, with the masking being lifted, the government saying that masks will be uh, optional in schools. You know, just a few weeks ago, we had the chief medical health officer telling people to wear their best mask possible, move to an N95 mask. Now, just a few weeks later, we'll be removing that mask mandate. Uh, Premier was saying that he believes he has majority support from the province, that people want to move in this direction, that uh, they've reached out to him, him and his caucus and to give people a sense. And I know you know this, uh, the Saskatchewan party has a massive majority here in Saskatchewan. Uh, they're, they're working from a position of strength. So when he says we have uh, our, our caucus, uh, their constituents reaching out to them, he's got a wide 
uh, you know, scan of the province, including Regina and Saskatoon, the two most populous cities. So um, we'll have to listen, wait and see what, what the reaction is over the next couple of weeks. You mentioned Alberta and Saskatchewan kind of uh, marching in a different direction, in some cases and sometimes to different provinces. In the summertime, both were forced to announce that they were going to reopen. Uh, that's It's hard to remember uh, all these different iterations throughout the uh, last couple of years, but that's that's uh, one thing that ended up getting both premiers, uh, Premier Kenny and Premier Mo, uh, a lot of uh, criticism when the fourth wave hit was that they moved too quickly, that it was uh, a rash decision, uh, that they had warnings about a potential uh, you know, new wave of, of COVID in the fall, and that they ignored those warnings. I can tell you in Saskatchewan, um, Saskatchewan was on, under you know, the least amount of public health measures over the last few months of any other province. So even Alberta had gathering limits um, Saskatchewan had no such thing. So there haven't been gathering limits here. The, the only public health measures have been mask mandates and the proof of vaccination uh, policies. Some places are saying they're going to keep proof of vaccination in. Interestingly enough, the Premier uh, said in his news conference this week that the province's preference, the government's preference, is that there are no public health measures in uh, different businesses. And he said that the regulations, which protected some businesses, uh, from lawsuits, uh, legal challenges, the province put in when they put in the proof of vaccination and the mask mandates, they'll be lifted as well when these uh, measures are lifted. So he's signaling to these businesses that, you know, you may be in some legal trouble. We have heard from some businesses that say, you know, it's our business, we're going to be able to run it how we want, we make the rules here. And uh, it'll depend on, um, you know, their comfortability with how things are and what their, I guess, what their, their customers want, and potentially what their what their employees want as well. Uh, no shirt, no shoes, no shot, no service, I guess, for some of these businesses. But, uh, you know, when you're talking about these moves and, and Scott Moe saying that he has a majority of the province behind him, you know, we're seeing these convoys, these protests that are uh, popping up everywhere across the country, not only just here in Ottawa. We've seen the uh, some border crossings now being blocked. Uh, do you think that Scott Moe is feeling any pressure from that side of the political spectrum? You know, the Buffalo Party didn't do know, really well in the last provincial election, but they did average about 9% support in the ridings where they um, where they ran candidates. You know, we're seeing the divisions within the United Conservatives that Jason Kenney is under pressure. Aaron O'Toole obviously just got booted out of the Conservative leadership in part over his position on this kind of thing. Is Scott Moe feeling that kind of pressure? I, I'm not sure if he's feeling the pressure. There's definitely, you know, people that are saying that Scott Moe is, is, is signaling to people that aren't vaccinated or have it or want the the health measures removed that um, that he's sort of on their side. He's had uh, a little bit of a switch in messaging over the last few months. In the fall, when the fourth wave hit and he put those measures in, he said that the people that were unvaccinated were prolonging the pandemic. And he was very strong language towards people who are unvaccinated. They're doing, he said, you know, people that are vaccinated are doing the right thing. You know, saying that people were unvaccinated, doing the wrong thing, obviously. This week, when he announced the measures were being lifted, he said it's time to heal our divisions, that we shouldn't be judging people, whether they were vaccinated or unvaccinated. In Saskatchewan uh, and Alberta, they're two of the least vaccinated provinces by percentage uh, still to this point, and they were in the fall as well. He admitted that the, those policies worked and increased the vaccination coverage across the province. 86% uh, roughly of adults are vaccinated with two doses in Saskatchewan. Uh, 80% over five. So there is still a high percentage of people uh, vaccinated here in Saskatchewan. Um, there's, a, there's a smaller number of people who haven't got one shot at all. There's about, you know, uh, I think 30,000 people that have that have, uh, have got one shot, but not two. Um, I'll have to double check those numbers. But, you know, my point is that we have a, a large percentage of people here in this province, a vast, vast majority have gotten two shots. Uh, Scott Moe has got criticism over the last couple of days. Uh, he had an interview on Wednesday with Power and Politics and David Cochran, where he was asked about those blockades that you mentioned. And he said, you know, no, he's not going to judge them for what they're doing, but they're certainly getting a lot of attention. And he pu pushed on the federal government, which we're hearing from quite a few premiers, uh, to, to do something about it. Uh, I, I put out a tweet uh, on Thursday morning showing Scott Moe's position just two years ago, almost to the day when there were blockades on rail lines. Uh, over pipeline protests, and he said that these are illegal and the rule of law should be obeyed. Um, so a completely different message on on similar blockades and similar tactics being used in just two different uh, in two years' time. And uh, that's you know that difference in messaging. A lot of people I think are noticing in Saskatchewan. We've had the legislature uh, closed for security concerns that happened 
uh, just before there was a planned uh, freedom convoy, solidarity, if you want to call it, uh, protest outside of the legislature on Saturday. It's coinciding with an outdoor winter festival, Eric, and the road into the legislature here in Saskatchewan has actually cement blocks blocking the road. So there was, wasn't going to be traffic in, in front of the legislature anyway this week, but we'll have to see what happens when this festival ends and if those blockades come up. But the doors are not really ever locked at the legislature, except for after hours. People can come in, they can take tours, they have to you know, go through security checks and all those things. But this is sort of an unprecedented step that they've taken. And this was a day before there was a planned, uh, you know, Freedom Convoy Solidarity uh, pr protest in Regina. I can tell you that that was a peaceful uh, solidarity uh, protest. Uh, there were no incidents that I know of. Uh, there was one car of, of a person who has been a so -called, so, sort of a local organizer of some of these protests throughout the last few months who was in Ottawa. And her protest sort of fizzled out. She had a few vehicles parked on the busiest road in the city next to the legislature. And after a few hours, she was the only one left sitting there. So the police, uh, you know, I think saw what was happening. Obviously, the road was blocked there. A def different experience than we're seeing even in, in other uh, capital cities in the country. But there's definitely that feeling here. Um, and Scott Mo also tried to uh, differentiate between people who are uh, denying COVID vaccine or spreading misinformation and people who are just tired of mandates, people that want sort of a signal that this is getting close to an end. But as I mentioned, there's still a lot of people out there that are concerned because there's still high case uh, test positivity here in Saskatchewan. And of course, I mentioned those hospitalization rates were nearing record highs for COVID related um, illness inside hospitals in Saskatchewan. And uh, when that happened last time, uh, that forced people to be uh, flown out of the province to Ontario for care. Uh, Scott Moe would have, I, I imagine, fewer divisions within the party on issues like this, of Saskatchewan you know, generally being a more conservative province. But I'm curious if you've heard any rumblings at all from the federal conservative leadership race that's just gotten started. Uh, you know, There has been these divisions that we're starting to see within the party from the Quebec wing, from maybe the Atlantic Canadian wing that is you know, more moderate than those from Western Canada. But in Saskatchewan, someone like Pierre Poliev, who is running for the leadership, is he likely to be garnering a lot of support in that kind of province? What Have you heard anything you know, reverberating from Ottawa there, all the way to Saskatchewan on that? I, I think it's a, it's a bit early to see, but I will say that you know, when Aaron O'Toole was, when that decision was made by the Conservative caucus, people will now be familiar with, and I know your listeners and viewers will be familiar with a photo of uh, Andrew Shear, Denise Batters, a conservative senator, has now been uh, put back into the conservative caucus after she was removed by Aaron O'Toole uh, and other um, Saskatchewan conservative MPs, including Kevin Waugh, who tweeted the, the photo of them beside a truck holding a Saskatchewan flag sort of in solidarity. That was earlier in the week. They got a lot of criticism for that photo. Um, and I talked to uh, Warren Steinley, who is uh, the MP for Regina Louvan who uh, after the decision was made on our tool, he was, you know, uh, hopeful and, uh, you know, was looking forward to the new chapter. You can read into that what you will. Uh, there has been, you know, people asking about Scott Moe because he's kind of uh, put himself in this position, uh, as you mentioned, with being the first to sort of remove restrictions at different points in the, in the pandemic. He's obviously a big um, cr critic of uh, the prime minister. Uh, the, there, there's really been no indication from anyone here that he has any interest in any sort of federal uh, move at this point. Uh, he's one of these so-called, I think, safest premiers we know with the kind of seat uh, distribution they have in the province. Um, the Conservatives also, also and uh, in the last federal election, got a huge percentage of the vote in Saskatchewan. Um, so th they're, they're, they're among the safest seats. Obviously, they have a suite. Um, so that, that's another thing to keep in mind. I, people always ask about Brad Wall as well, the former Saskatchewan premier. I don't know if you wanted to ask me about that, but you know we have also reached out to Brad Wall, and and uh, he's active on Twitter. He has um, you know been sharing some of the similar tweets and thoughts about the pandemic as Scott Moe has in the last few weeks. People sort of speculated though Brad Wall's you know being a little more outspoken here is now now is there an interest in him running? I noticed that whenever there's those graphics on different news stories, he's always kind of included in the the collage of people that may. Uh, seek the leadership. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, if, if that's in the cards as well. He seems to be pretty happy with his role. He's got a consulting firm. He works for you know law firms. He works. Uh, he's on a number of different energy boards across across Western Canada. So he seems to be pretty uh, pretty uh, happy with his position now. 
And of course, the French issue is also something that comes up in Saskatchewan. Uh, I don't think Brad Wall or Scott Moore are taking French lessons. And uh, Andrew Shear obviously could speak French uh, as being a Regina MP who ran for, uh, who was the leader of the Conservative Party. Um, but I, I don't see that as being something that's necessarily in the cards this time around. I know that uh, Scott Moe has been, you know, sharing some of Pierre Polyev's tweets. Uh, I could relate it to the convoy as well. You can read into that what you will as well. Uh, I, I think in Saskatchewan too, when the, and you'll know this better and better than me, but in the last round of uh, conservative voting, um, Leslie Lewis did, did, did very well here and Peter McKay did poorly. And I think even though Peter McKay had some people here in, this, in the province and some conservatives that were supporting him, he didn't translate into getting the vote out when it was, uh, came to conservative members uh, voting for, for the new leader. So um, that's something that I think, uh, and I also, I also want to raise, Maxime Bernier um, held his election night uh, right. in Saskatoon. And so that is another thing that people should keep in mind. And I know there's been a lot of talk about uh, Candace Bergen and and her her riding and and uh, the the vote for the PPC, the strong vote for the PPC there. Um, as you know, when you mentioned the Buffalo Party in Saskatchewan, which is you know um, has gotten a couple of pockets of the province and done done fairly well in the in the provincial election, the PPC um, did did okay here as well, and they, they 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 took a bit of the vote, and I think you know that that can't be dismissed at all. And the fact that Max Bernier was in Saskatoon on election night. One of the reasons was because of the, the the rules around uh, vaccinations and, and things at that point that they could that they could be doing. Um, there was obviously a lot of mask issues at that election night coverage and indoors and and some controversy over that. But um, that's just something I, I think I, I think it's important to note as well. Yeah, and uh, the mentioning of Leslie Lewis's performance in Saskatchewan that's also something to keep an eye on. So uh, you know whether those social conservative candidates will uh, be spending a lot of time in the province, but. How about let's move over to the New Democrats. So Ryan Miley has uh, survived as NDP leader an election, which is a rare thing over the last decade. And he survived an inter um, a leadership vote, I should say. Um, not exactly a huge portion of the vote. He was somewhere in the 70s, which you know is not really that terrific. We saw Andrew Horvath in Ontario just get 85%. Uh, but what is the morale right now for the New Democrats on the opposition benches again? Uh, do, they, do they see any light at the end of this tunnel? Uh, it's interesting that you men mentioned Orbath because uh, when the leadership uh, vote was taken, uh, you know, just a few months ago, it was pointed out that Wab Canoe and uh, Rachel Notley also did much better than than Ryan Miley did. So if you look at just across those provinces, you know, he was the, the lowest, uh, which does signal that there is, you know, some disappointment in the party with the performance in the election. Um, you mentioned that they have we have this by election coming up here next week. And the NDP need that seat. They need to hold on to it. Uh, that's 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 a must must win. Um, so that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on. Ryan Miley's kind of pushed back, and the party sort of pushed back against this old guard, new guard um, the division. So to go back a couple of elections ago, the NDP had a decision to make on their leader. Ryan Miley had run for leadership at that time. They decided to bring Dwayne Ligenfelter in, who is a former cabinet minister uh, in the Romano government. And he did very poorly, didn't even win um, his, his, his own battle in, in Regina, Douglas Park, which was seen as a safe seat. And he lost to a, a rookie. And the NDP has subsequently won the last two elections in that seat. So it shows you, um, you know, just how maybe unpopular the party was or that leadership choice was at that time. Uh, since then, you know, there's been a bit of a rejuvenation, I would say, within uh, the NDP caucus. Uh, a few of uh, the people that have were around um, under Lingenfelter and other leaders, Cam Broden, they've since left. It's been a long time for them in opposition. Uh, one former cabinet minister, David Forbes, left. Uh, we saw Buckley Belanger, who is a long time, the longest serving MLA actually in, in, in Saskatchewan, step down to run for the Liberals actually in the federal election. Uh, so there's been sort of a turnover and the NDP has gotten younger, and it's gotten more, more women in their caucus, and uh, young, they're young mothers, so two or three uh, have, have, have young children. And that's been a, a quite a noticeable difference uh, when you compare it to the Saskatchewan party. So even though Saskatchewan party has a, a vast majority of the seats, uh, they have a much different uh, makeup in caucus than they're primarily men. 
um, and they're, they skew a, a little bit older, um, specifically the women in, in their caucus, when you look at the NDP. Um, and Ryan Miley is, is different than some of the other leaders that have, that have come through the ranks for the NDP. He's a doctor. Um, during the pandemic, he's been very outspoken. He's well-connected on pandemic issues and healthcare issues. He typically has known um, what was coming and uh, you know, heard from doctors firsthand, so he's been able to raise some of those concerns, perhaps before the media um, are aware. Um, and he's also gotten criticism for being a bit alarmist on that as well, because people say he's a doctor, you know, he's, he's, he's sticking to that narrative. And the NDP has trouble here, um, kind of shaking the, the thought that the Saskatchewan party is the prosperity party, that things sort of boomed when Bradwell came in and that things weren't, well, weren't you know, good under the NDP when they were in power. Um, they were in power for a number of years, you know, 1991 to 2007 is a long time. And the NDP, and especially the old heads in the NDP, will point out that they were at least early in their in their run were cleaning up after the divine government from the uh, 80s and 90s, and, and some of the budgeting and and other issues and controversies that came up from that government. So, um, Saskatchewan's a conservative stronghold right now. We're at Ryan Miley. He wouldn't uh, he won't make any bones that he's got his work work cut out for him. And there's uh, another thing that's in play in Saskatchewan. It's that the NDP has no presence and no seats. Uh, outside of uh, Regina and Saskatoon, uh, apart from the northern seats. So they can't get into the smaller cities uh, of Prince Albert and Moose Jaw, which where they typically, that when they were in power and even when they had a strong opposition, they had seats there. Uh, but they don't seem to be making breakthroughs there. I know that's a goal of the NDP. They've had a bit of a review within the party um, to try and push towards the next election in 2024. And they're they're trying to run as a provincial party and they've had a lot of um, just within the party and the, the behind the scenes, the structure of the party, some of the leaders uh, at the provincial level have switched around. Uh, so they're seeing that as a rejuvenation um, and a Ryan Miley is sort of pushing to get out and meet more people, get his caucus up, get out and meet more people. The problem with that right now in the pandemic is uh, people are doing a lot of things over Zoom as we are <laughs> right now. <laughs> so it's hard to you know meet face to face and make those connections sometimes when you uh, when you when you can't get out in person, and it's the SAS party has the same same problem. They have the same problem during the election. The difference is they out they out fundraise the NDP, and as I mentioned, they have they have, they have more seats. They're they're more popular, so they they do have that advantage. The NDP is going to be closing the gap, though. The Angus Reid uh, surveys of the premiers uh, and even the party surveys have shown that the NDP has closed the gap considerably. Um, they're nowhere near where they think they should be or where they want to be, uh, but. That's something that I think that they're maybe holding on to. They're seeing as uh, as positive. Premier Mo's popularity in those in those polls has dropped considerably. He was over sixty percent at one point. He's dropped below fifty percent in the last two uh, those surveys, which is sort of uh, surprising because the Saskatchewan Premier is going back to Brad Wall. They cons consistently were over fifty percent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's something to note as well. And uh, maybe not getting much help from the federal New Democrats who aren't that popular in Saskatchewan. And I remember in that post-election report, one of the considerations was, you know, trying to differentiate the Saskatchewan NDP from the federal NDP, maybe even considering dropping the branding, which they decided not to go ahead with. But it does show that it is a complicated thing to be uh, a New Democrat in Saskatchewan, which I guess isn't this problem in Alberta, where Alberta, the NDP is very popular and more popular, much more popular than the federal NDP, but uh, Saskatchewan being, you know, the home of the New Democratic Party, um, that divide is is a, is a bit of an interesting, is a, an interesting thing that you see uh, in Saskatchewan. And the Liberal Party has no presence here. Yeah. So federally, definitely, since Ralph Goodell um, lost his election, uh, they, they dropped considerably in the, in the number of votes they got in the last election, as you know. And feder uh, provincially, they they have a new leader who's trying to, uh, um, I guess, get support and build something. But they've had just a revolving door of people uh, and leaders. They're they're not they haven't been a part of any debates. Um, they don't get a high percentage of the vote. They most people wouldn't really even realize there's a, there is a provincial liberal party. They wouldn't be able to name the new leader. Um, so that's another thing that's in play in Saskatchewan. There is a two party system, but we mentioned the Buffalo Party earlier. And interestingly enough, the Buffalo Party is actually running a candidate in this uh, upcoming by uh, upcoming by election, which I was I, I wasn't surprised to see because I think they're they're trying to to be competitive in different uh, in different races. 
uh, but it was a, a sort of a later addition to to the list, and we'll see how that how that um, comes out because Northern Saskatchewan hasn't necessarily been a target for these um, these 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 new parties, the Buffalo Party uh, or the PPC. Uh, they're typically sticking to rural Saskatchewan and, and running a few candidates in the cities, but their 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 base of support and sort of their their focus has been these rural seats where they think they have a shot, you know, maybe in, in two years time. So. Um, I'm interested to see what kind of vote uh, turnout there is for the Buffalo Party in that riding. Well, let's finish on that uh, by-election in Athabasca. So the NDP has held this seat. The only time they lost it was when Belanger ran as a Liberal in the 90s and then subsequently ran as the New Democrat in a by-election after that. So it's pretty much been an NDP seat since its creation. The boundaries haven't changed since the, the 70s. Um, so is it a foregone conclusion that the NDP wins this seat? I, I don't like making predictions. Um, I'll leave that to you. I think the I, I think there there'd be a lot of surprise. It would send shockwaves if if the NDP lost for a couple of reasons. One, the obvious one is they've never lost the seat, um, uh, as you mentioned with Buckley um, running for the Liberals, uh, and Georgina Jol Jolie Bois is a former MP. She's a, a been the mayor of Lalash on a, a number of occasions. She's most was most recently the mayor of Lalash, which is you know, a, a, a big uh, area um, where she has a lot of support and a lot of name recognition. Um, she was, uh, she put a private member's bill in while she was an MP for uh, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day to become a national holiday. Um, she, she's obviously been outspoken about a lot of Indigenous issues. Uh, you know, the, the Colton Bucci shooting, the uh, Walash school shooting as well. Um, so she has a lot of um, name recognition, a lot of support in the area. Of course, she did lose uh, her bid for re-election in uh, federally to Gary Vidal, who's the uh, conservative MP, and, and won again. And she was running against another popular uh, mayor at the time, uh, Tammy Cook-Searson, uh, who ran for the Liberals. Uh, this time around, Jim LeMegg is the uh, candidate for the Saskatchewan party. I talked to him. Um, he's a, uh, uh, left the RCMP after about 14 years to work for the provincial government in a policing program. They're both from the same uh, First Nation, Clearwater River Diné Nation. And he says that, you know, there are people that pushed him to seek the nomination because they think that the, that area of the province is left out of a lot of conversations because they don't have uh, a representative in the government. And the other northern seat, which is held by the NDP. Um, so he thinks that there's a, there's a road in there because the Saskatchewan party needs a voice there. And maybe there's local leaders and chiefs and you know community members who think that they're being left out of the conversation because they don't have an MLA. Uh, there's an independent as well running in that. And I mentioned the Buffalo party. So there's four candidates. And uh, the last election, I think it was about 600 votes that Buckley Belanger won by. And that was the closest it's ever been uh, in that riding. So that's something that I think, you know, it's a lot of ground to make up. and. The NDP has been pushing really hard in that area. Scott Moe did go up to Lalash and area and do some campaigning before they announced the uh, the uh, the writ was going to be on February fifteenth, which is actually the last day they could have announced it, uh, or had they had the election. And then he made a couple of announcements. It was sort of a Lalash school reannouncement where they announced a project, but they're announcing the location of it. And then he announced a, a road project that the government started years ago to try and connect to Alberta and Fort McMurray. He then subsequently sent a letter to Jason Kenney saying, pretty please, can you finish the other side of this road so we can complete this? The NDP said this is, you know, campaigning before the campaign is trying to curry favor and win votes. Uh, but roads are a big issue up there and uh, safety. And that's one of the things that Julie Bois said when she announced her candidacy that she, she wanted to focus on that. And COVID-19 is a big issue as well. Um, I mentioned earlier on that the FSIN here, the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, is, is against what the government's doing with removing measures. Um, indigenous areas and, and communities in Saskatchewan have been hard hit by the pandemic, some uh, including Lalash uh, specifically at different times and different waves. And so um, that's something that I think with mental health uh, that both candidates have talked about, uh, the NDP is really um, focused on that as well as being one of their main messages. And I feel really interesting to see the voter turnout as well. They're pushing for elections. Saskatchewan's pushing for a lot of mail-in ballots. Advanced voting's already started. It was obviously, it's a, it's a big area. It's, it's, it's unlike, uh, you know, voting in the city 
And so there are a lot of challenges there. Obviously, it's February as well. Um, so it, that could that could challenge turnout. Uh, but we'll see what happens on, on Tuesday. Uh, as I mentioned, the NDP, you know, they need that seat. They have to get state at 13. Um, it would be a huge blow for, for Ryan Miley if, if somehow they were to lose that. Yeah, and just in case, you know, if you're outside of Saskatchewan, uh, you know, it is a small, it is a riding that's geographically very large, but the population is is uh, very small compared to other ridings, and it's predominantly Indigenous. And as you mentioned, there are going to be all those challenges for turnout. So in a by-election, 600 votes in a general election might not sound like a lot, but in a riding like that, um, Belanger still ended up winning by 20 percentage points, right? So uh, we'll see what the results will be and also how it compares to past results, right? Because as you mentioned, that's the closest it's been. Uh, the Saskatchewan party putting up its best result and the NDP its worst result since uh, at least with Belanger on the ballot. Um, so at least there will be some measuring sticks, but the, the, the presence of the Buffalo party, the independent candidate, which if I'm not mistaken, ran for the NDP nomination. Yes, that's uh, right. So there could be some complicating factors, but um, while... I think most people would expect that the NDP wins a seat. As you said, they need to win the seat, uh, but there could be some other things that make it make it pretty interesting to see what the results will be. Yeah, I think it's going to be uh, something that we're going to get a, a bit of a channel changer on uh, on the pandemic news cycle here for a few days. Um, but it's been, you know, tough to keep up with. You know, all the things that are happening. It's uh, the the by election is is kind of taking a back seat a little bit with all the other news that's been breaking recently and. And the challenges of covering, uh, you know, by-election and campaign during a pandemic in an area that's, as you mentioned, you know, sparsely populated and is so far away from most media outlets uh, here in Saskatchewan. Well, we'll keep an eye out on the results uh, on Tuesday and, and afterwards. They have to count some of those mail ballots afterwards. But Adam, really appreciate you coming on the podcast to give us this update on uh, how things look from Saskatchewan. You're welcome, Eric. Thanks for having me anytime. Thanks again to Adam Hunter for coming on the podcast. And if you like this video, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Every week I do have these podcast interviews. And as we get through this, you know, pretty busy political year with the conservative leadership race, we've got provincial elections in Ontario and Quebec and probably more. Uh, I'll have uh, some other things on the channel as well. So uh, please like, please subscribe, please share it widely. And I'll see you next week.